Hi, this is Fred Sroka with Golden Gate University, and I'm here with Lasana Karim. And Lasana, you recently joined our adjunct faculty as an international tax professor, and I think your first class you're teaching starting in January? That's right. It's very exciting. Thanks so much for joining us, and thank you for joining me in this conversation. We're going to briefly go through the proposed changes to international tax provisions in the House version HR1 and in the Senate Finance Committee's chair's markup. These were both passed late last week. This is Monday, November 20. Please understand that there are going to be many, many changes before we know whether and what the tax reform is going to look like. Is that a fair caveat, Lasana? Definitely, definitely. That said, we're going to focus on what actions should we be talking to our clients about in a time of uncertainty when we don't know if there's going to be changes we know that if there are changes, they're likely to be dramatic in scope. In walking through it, could I please ask you to just give us the basic framing? Um, what is this shift in cross-border taxation that the Congress is proposing? Yep. So the shift is from a worldwide tax system to a participation exemption regime, um, which someone would also call a territoriality system. And uh, I couldn't agree with you more. It's uh, very exciting times right now. I think it's the massive change um, in the international tax space since yep. the 86 Act. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, for those who aren't specialists, pretty much every other country has gone to a territorial system, right? Aren't we one of the very few that try to tax people on their global income? That's right. Mm -hmm. And by taxing on your global income, the problem is all people need to do is form offshore corporations to try to bottle it up. And so what we see is that the use of foreign subsidiaries is very common. So if I have a U.S. corporation, I form a foreign subsidiary, that income gets bottled up unless it's kind of bad income, right? What we call CFC subpart F or something like that. Correct. Now, if I run a foreign branch, meaning I don't form a separate corporation, um, how are the rules working currently and what is the proposed change, if any? Yeah. So actually for a foreign branch and also for um, U.S. companies who generates uh, U.S. sales and service income, they're still going to be subject to U.S. taxes, but the foreign branch would have a would be eligible to offset their U.S. tax again with the uh, foreign tax credits. Got it. So, basically, you pay the higher of the foreign rate or the U.S. rate. Mm -hmm. Would that oh, so overall a net disincentive to operate as a foreign branch, right? Correct. Correct. Got it. Mm -hmm. And one other change is. There was that bad income called subpart F, but also another thing that was included was any time you have money offshore, for example, Apple has an awful lot of cash offshore. If they invested from that offshore entity down into a U.S. investment, that was considered a bad thing, right? Like a deemed dividend, and mm -hmm. it was taxed to the U.S. Mm -hmm. Isn't that provision going away also what we call Section 956 inclusions? Yes. With the TCJA, um, they are going to be repealing 956, which are investments in U.S. property by uh, CFCs. Mm -hmm. Got it. So in this is dramatic change. We don't have to worry about earning money offshore. We can bring it back onshore as long as we had it in a foreign sub that we owned at least 10% of, which is a pretty low percentage. Yep. Mm -hmm. Dramatic change. Thank mm -hmm. you. Now, that gives away an awful lot of revenue. The House and the Senate have said, well, we're giving away some, but there's going to be other incentives. Could you please compare what's happening in the House version that has passed and the Senate finance version that's only passed the committee? Sure. Um, so, yeah, the House version, the Ways and Means Bill, uh, imposed a, a global min tax on above routine foreign earnings. The Senate did as well. So I think at the end of the day, the objectives are similar. But the key difference is that the Senate version also included a 12.5% tax on the foreign-derived tangible income. So if you look at the difference of the rules, um, I would say that the scope of the um, guilt inclusion, which is global um, low-tax inclusion income, according to the Senate version, the scope of the CFC-tested income is going to be bigger than that of the House version. And so as a result, the income inclusion will be bigger. And uh, the, guilt, uh, guilt, the guilty um, computations, unfortunately, are way more complex as well than the House uh, version. 
Got it. So in general, what we see is that subpart F income, that's that mobile income that you earn in a foreign subsidiary, mm -hmm. you still have to pay current U.S. tax on that, and that would presumably be at the 20% rate that they're proposing for mm -hmm. the default rate for all corporations? Correct. And then this extra income, whatever extra stuff you're earning offshore, that's what the House version called the high returns income, and that's what the Senate version calls guilty. I presume guilty until proven innocent. <laughs> Might be the one. And that's going to be taxed at either a 10 or 12 and a half percent rate. Correct. Is the proposal. Mm -hmm. Got it. Now, what that does is it says earning money, especially mobile income offshore, makes you kind of a bad kid. But there's a lot of incentives in there saying rather than having American corporations send all their IP offshore, hey, use the United States as your IP holding company, right? Mm -hmm. And this is a huge shift. Could right. you briefly walk us through the incentives, the carrots and sticks to try to get people to bring all their patents and stuff back to the U.S.? Well, um, if you, for with domestication of IP, uh, that I think that's uh, IP equivalent to, I think, uh, the foreign countries' IP box regime that we have seen elsewhere. And, um, so for three years I can bring it back to the United States and I don't tax owe any free, tax, right? right. Oh, exactly. that's a cool thing. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then how about on an ongoing basis, if what I'm doing is I'm earning the money offshore, I've got that guilty tax that is kind of a, a stick, but if I earn the money in the U.S. and charge royalties to my foreign affiliates, I thought I got a 10% rate on that foreign source income, the FDII foreign-derived intangible income? That's right. The U.S. parent would also get a um, lower tax rate on its own foreign-derived tangible income, the FDII. So that is a new addition to the Senate proposal that's welcome. Got it. So pulling this all together, we're now dramatically changing the U.S. tax structure from global to territorial. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to give companies an incentive to say, stop shipping all of your valuable patents and stuff like that mm -hmm. offshore, maybe mm -hmm. keep them here. Right. Right. And the House, we don't know exactly how it's working, but the Senate, it's a combination of carrots and sticks, mm -hmm. saying, mm -hmm. do more in the U.S. and we'll charge you lower tax. Yep. Wonderful. Thank you. That makes sense. Here's the problem. When you've got a global system and we have large corporations that have a huge amount of retained earnings offshore, and then we say we're going to go to a territorial system. How do you transition? How do you change from one system to the other? That's a great question. Well, um, what the Act has proposed, uh, the Senate and the House version, is a transition tax, um, shifting from the old system to the new system. And so this transition tax is computed on the future foreign earnings, actually the tax-deferred foreign earnings, of all your CFCs, control foreign corporations. And I think that actually, besides the CFCs, it also hits these uh, 1050 companies, which previously, you know, as international tax practitioners, we didn't have to worry about subpart F implications, but that's not going to be the case. And so um, it's going to be a transition tax, or um, you might have heard a mandatory toll charge, and it's imposed on the foreign ENP calculated based on if it's cash and cash equivalents. Um, ENP, the Senate version says it's going to be taxed at 10% or 5% um, if it's business assets, right? Got mm -hmm. it. So we've got all this stuff that we never paid U.S. tax on, and now what's going to happen is at some date, we don't know if it's November 2, November 9, or December 31, we're going to measure all of that, and kaboom, it pops into taxable income. Mm -hmm. Well, that could be a huge amount of tax. Do we have to pay it all at once? Thankfully, it could be paid erratably over eight years and um, eligible for foreign tax credit. Wonderful. So, <laughs> so there might be a significant tax liability. I think the House says rateably. Doesn't the Senate have some crazy thing that backloads the back years, if I remember correctly? Um, hmm. I... I'd be willing to bet yeah. you a nickel on that, only because I remember <laughs> looking at it saying, why would these crazy people do that? But I believe I'm as surprised. long as they got credit for the revenue, they figured mm -hmm. they'd be nicer. Yep. Got it. So what we've got is a triggering event mm -hmm. on the conversion. Mm -hmm. They say, we're going to make you pay tax. Good news, we're going to give you a discount on your tax. And then to the extent that you're just keeping cash offshore, 
then you're a bad kid and we're going to charge you somewhere between 10 and 12 percent payable over eight years. Mm -hmm. To the extent you were using that money offshore, what we call business assets, mm -hmm. then you're kind of a good kid, so we're going to charge you somewhere right. between 5 and 7 percent. Right. Now, the foreign tax credit that gets applied against this, I'd imagine most multinationals have paid at least 5 percent on mm -hmm. all their offshore earnings. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. looks a little bit scary, like it's just a giveaway. Do you, could you help us a little bit understand, are we just going to have a computation of tax but then get it wiped out by all these foreign tax credits? How is that going to play out? Well, I don't think that it's going to be um, as uh, simple as it is, but I do understand there is like a house uh, drafting error that one of our faculty has pointed out during one of our discussions. Yeah, I think Professor Boo <laughs> yeah, was the one who said, right. Fred, <laughs> yeah. the Senate reduces the foreign tax credits, the House bill may not, but mm -hmm. let's, by the time it gets out of conference committee, is it reasonable to assume since they're, uh, they're saying this is going to generate revenue for the Treasury, right. probably companies are going to have to write a check sooner or later, mm -hmm. right? Yep, yep. And Agreed. hopefully over eight years. Mm -hmm. And then there's a weird provision about S-Corps that have foreign subsidiaries where I guess what happens is they have to compute that tax, but then rather than pay it over eight years, they uh -huh. get to wait pretty much forever till they sell or liquidate or mm -hmm. get rid of their S election, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. Sound right? Agreed, yeah, yeah. Wonderful. So the transition is going to be scary. There's a lot of planning associated with it. Right. In a very compressed time frame, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Lasana, we, in the business slide deck, we talked about there is already a proposed limit on the extent to which companies can leverage themselves, which is your interest expense can't be more than 30% of your adjusted taxable income. Mm -hmm. So too much debt um, compared to your income makes you a bad kid and you lose the tax deduction on the interest and it gets carried forward. Right. There's a second limit that applies when you've got foreign affiliates. Could you briefly walk us through those rules? Yes, the second hurdle would be that the net interest expense of the U.S. group um, with its debt equity ratio not to be more than 110% of its worldwide overall ratio. Got it. So kind of the peanut butter rule, right? You should spread right. the interest expense over all your different operations, domestic and international. And what do they use as the measuring stick, please? Because I think they differ, don't they? Right. The Senate version uses the basis of uh, adjusted basis of assets to allocate interest expense, and the House uses EBITDA. Got it. Mm -hmm. So that means the House version is probably way more volatile, right? Because Correct. your income can bounce around like crazy. Mm -hmm. And then that Senate using adjusted basis. But to me, it would make common sense to use the fair market value of assets, and that's always been our rule under 864E and the 861.18 regs, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. So yep. what they're saying is now we want to kind of bend the rules slightly, pretending we're being fair. Yep. <laughs> Got Great. it. Okay. <laughs> that makes sense. And then to the extent that we go too much, so the U.S. has too much interest expense, it doesn't get reassigned. We just kind of disallow it and carry it forward, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. It could be carried indefinitely. Uh, right. In the Senate version. I, did, I thought... Five years in the House, does that ring a bell? Correct, right. Got it. So we don't know exactly how long you get to carry it forward. Mm -hmm. And finally, um, does this only apply to big kids? No. Well, actually, initially it did in the House version, but the de minimis exception for groups with combined gross receipts of $100 million or less did not make it to the Senate proposal. Got so. it. So it could even apply to smaller corporation, so we need to really worry about interest expense. Hard to think of much we do before the end of the year on this, but in terms of future planning, <clears throat> either loading too much debt compared to your total taxable income, or loading more debt in the U.S. entity as opposed to your foreign affiliates, mm -hmm. both of those are just going to wind up hurting you rather than helping you. Agreed. Got it. Gee, um, there are lots of other changes. If I remember correctly, between House and Senate, it was well over 700 pages but could we briefly go through a few of the ones that might impact a, a significant number of taxpayers? With respect to the sourcing of income, we care a lot about whether it's U.S. source or foreign source uh, for a bunch of reasons, including foreign tax credit. Uh, in the past, we've always been able to shift the sourcing of our manufactured inventory, at least mm -hmm. half of it, just by having title transfer in a different place, right? right? Could you briefly run through the change there? Yeah. So now with the proposed uh, tax reform, income from the sale of manufactured inventory is now sourced based on place of production. 
and so it's going to be different as Got it. what you just. So shared. we always sourced half of that of the income, right, based on where we manufactured 50, 50. it. Now it's going to Correct. be hundred percent based. So it basically takes away a lot of what we used to use as a standard way of trying to plan for use of more foreign tax credits. Mm -hmm. There are changes to various U.S. possessions. I don't think those will apply to very many people, but there are significant additional provisions in the Senate proposal that try to, again, use sticks to punish people from going abroad, right? Yep. Could you briefly run through those? Yeah, I think uh, the definition of IP has been extended or updated in the Senate version, um, the Senate proposal, and now it includes goodwill and going concern as well as workplace force. Wow, mm -hmm. okay. And so what that means is it's tougher to get your IP offshore or to get the value associated with it offshore? Right, right. Got it. So mm -hmm. that's another stick combined with a carrot of, hey, keep it here, we'll tax you at a lower rate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Got it. And how about that crazy, we know the Europeans have adopted base erosion and profit shifting rules mm -hmm. in their directives called BEPS. The Senate also talks about a base erosion tax. Could you briefly run through that one? Yeah, I think this base erosion tax would... Um, equate to kind of like the excise tax, the 20% excise tax on the Senate um, proposal or that the didn't House make version, it through. Right? In the, oh, that's right, thank you. In the House version that didn't make it through, which was imposed, I, we all agree that it's a ludicrous tax that imposes on foreign related party payments, and we're like, what company's not going to um, go with that? But yeah, now they're going to have a 10% base erosion minimum tax to, right. as a base erosion protection measure. Right. Our mm -hmm. son loves Tesla, and apparently the only thing above ludicrous mode is plaid. comes from Spaceballs, the movie, but I think it's fair to say that, yeah, some of these proposals move towards plaid. <laughs> Lasana, thank you so much for running through this. Here's what's scary. There are a lot of very detailed summaries being published right now, but a lot of our alumni have no idea what can I say to my client that my client will, number one, understand, and number two, that might make a difference in their actions between now and the end of the year. Right. So the focus of this really should be on, is there anything actionable, given the uncertainty associated with, will there be any legislation that actually makes it through the Senate and Conference Committee? Mm -hmm. And second, um, what will that provide? So could you walk through what you've seen that you think might be worth advising clients on? Yeah. So actually, a, a lot of folks... Um, are thinking that the tax reform uh, will be enacted this year, early next year, and as we all know, if it happens, it's going to be a very compressed time frame that we're going to, you know, as much as we all want to kind of step back and take a look at our global paradigm, I think we're, we're, we're going to be pressed for time. So mm -hmm. some of the things that I um, think that you can think about is perhaps looking at your foreign branches, how you're, you're um, operating your foreign business. Maybe you might want to incorporate your foreign branches and uh, take advantage of the participation exemption regime. Um, you could do that by filing a check the box by March 15th of next year for this to, to be effective. January 1st for um, eligible entities. Got it, because foreign mm -hmm. branches get included in your U.S. return, whereas foreign subs, it's kind of like 10 or you more. get it free, right, um, right. subject to all those minimum tax type things. Right. So we get a little bit of time, right? We can wait, but we need to start doing the work right now to figure out mm -hmm. should we be thinking about it. Right. But right. the good news is you can make a retroactive decision on that one. Correct, right. Could I ask you about a, a second one that isn't on there? We saw that that uh, transition payment, the effective date's going to be in sometime in November or December of 2017. Mm -hmm. Have you heard anybody talk about deciding to change their taxable year to take advantage of those that's, benefits for fiscal years? Yeah, I think that's a great, great point. Um, I think that that would warrant another conversation or thought to see if you might want to have a change of tax year because fiscal year ta taxpayers might end up having a windfall with the um, territorial um, transition tax. Yeah, there's huge mm -hmm. other implications to changing your tax year, right? But if mm -hmm. there's a big enough tax savings, right. you used mm -hmm. to have to, if you wanted to change your tax year, you used to have to file within 45 days after the end of the short period. So if people wanted an October 31 year end, uh, we might not know the rules. Mm -hmm. But now I think that IRS has changed that. I think you get till January 15. Okay. But again, mm -hmm. it would probably ruin your tax advisor's holiday 
<laughs> period, right? If they have to yeah. do all the modeling with respect to it. That's right. You also need to show that you have a substantial business purpose. Now, if you're distorting income, that's not considered a substantial business purpose. If it's tax motivated, that's considered bad. Mm -hmm. But most of the examples refer to accelerating income, um, deferring income, or changing deductions, distorting your actual income. This wouldn't be that, right? This would just be a lower tax rate? Mm -hmm. Who knows? Mm -hmm. Maybe it could be. Yeah. <laughs> cool. And then what else? If you've got foreign subs already, um, what planning could you see that would really help there? Uh, well, uh, you can also think about capital structure with respect to the interest expense limitation, especially in view that um, there's a big possibility that interest expense is going to be evaluated based on adjusted basis instead of fair market value. Yeah, mm -hmm. and as we take a look at our foreign subs, Anything we can do, certainly domestically, we want to defer income and accelerate deductions, right? Mm -hmm. But I bet you that in the foreign subs, we might want to do the same thing because, again, if we know that it's all going to be free of any U.S. tax as mm -hmm. of January 1, 2018, mm -hmm. or we think there's a chance of it, mm -hmm. doesn't mm -hmm. it sound like deferral might be a well worth pursuing? Oh, definitely. Interest? Definitely, right. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, here's a scary thing. It used to be FAS 109, now we call it ASC 740, but the tax provision. The auditors need to get that out sometime early next year. And to the extent that this becomes effective, actually passed and is signed by before January 1, 2018, mm -hmm. that's a change in tax that I think needs to be reflected in the current year financial statements, right? Right, right. That's a great point, um, Fred. And I think that companies should need to take a look and evaluate what the tax implications will be for their deferred tax assets and liabilities once the bill is enacted. And uh, I think this is going to be yeah, a very compressed time frame. It's not like anything they need to do right now, but once the bill is enacted, I don't think there's a lot of time for them to consider the implications. Right, and because we're moving such huge numbers, right, triggering tax on all of our offshore earnings that we probably said were permanently reinvested. Yes. And then for our deferred tax assets, picking those up at the lower future rate. Mm -hmm. It could mm -hmm. be dramatic. And what's scary is even if the uh, the legislation isn't signed by December 31, I bet you it's a material Disclosure. subsequent event. Yeah, yeah. So I bet you have to do a footnote. Correct. Right. right. Mm -hmm. Got it. And overall, if we stop and say, wow, tax rates are being proposed to drop pretty much 50%, 35 down to 20, and more than 50% on foreign mm -hmm. derived intangible income, whatever you want to call guilty, the uh, other offshore income, this is going to really impact operations going forward. I guess the hard question is, do you anticipate that companies are going to respond by keeping their IP here? What do you think is going to be the response over the next year or two as companies take a look at the dramatically different structure of U.S. tax? Well, I think it's going to be, you know, with a, a more level global playing field, I would imagine that, yeah, companies would t start thinking whether they should keep the IP instead of moving it offshore. Um, I think it's going to be um, worthwhile looking at all those like options, you know, and having those conversations internally or with your clients. Wonderful. So mm -hmm. what we're hearing is there are some things that we really ought to be discussing with our clients right away before we know what the rules are, and then mm -hmm. waiting for the the legislation to play out, see whether or not we wind up with legislation and what it provides, but anticipate that this is going to be a dramatic change in how multinationals build their structures and operate their business mm -hmm. for many years to come. Yep, agreed. Lasana, thanks so much for the guidance you've given us. Well, thank you, Fred, for having me.